we are about to commence and we have about 60 people online and I'm sure more will be joining us in a moment. Okay, so good, good evening everybody and welcome to our virtual program, A Colonial Divorce, Drawing the Boundaries of New South Wales. So to begin with, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I work and live and recognize their continuing connection to land, water and community. And I pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. And I welcome all Aboriginal people in the audience tonight. My name is Rita and in the background, I have my co-hosts, Daniela and Scarlett as my panelists support, because as you know, we're all coming from our, um, our homes this evening, representing the Parliament of New South Wales. And it's lovely to have you all here and to see there is so much interest in the history of the Parliament of New South Wales and the forming of our democracy. The drawing of our boundaries being an essential feature of the nation we have become. Did you know Victoria separated from New South Wales 170 years ago? It was, was it an amicable, an amicable breakup or was it acrimonious and how did it happen? Well, that's what we're here to find out about tonight. So we're looking to find out more information with our guest historian, Dr. Andre, Andre Brett, who you see on your screens at the moment. So, but before we commence, I would like to hand over to the president of the Legislative Council, the Honourable Matthew Mason Cox, member of the Legislative Council to say a few words. Look, uh, thank you very much, Rita, and welcome everybody to Parliament Online and to this very important talk this evening. As you would be aware, House Talks is a program where the Parliament features experts and special guests who highlight the historical and cultural topics that relate to our history and particularly to that of the Parliament of New South Wales. As you can see behind me, uh, I trust, uh, is the Legislative Council. The Legislative, Legislative Council was the first uh, House of Parliament in Australia. Indeed, it was established in 1823 by uh, a United Kingdom um, Act of Parliament, and uh, it celebrates its bicentenary in 2023-2024, which we're very much looking forward to. And I can, as a, as a free advertisement, uh, let you know there'll be a lot of events celebrating that over the course of the next two years. Tonight's presentation, however, is a colonial divorce drawing the boundaries of New South Wales, which will look at the events that establish the current borders as this month marks the 170th anniversary since the separation of Victoria from New South Wales in 1851. We don't miss them that much though, do we? Anyway, to talk about this important historical event, we have a special guest tonight, Dr. Andre uh, Brett. He will talk about the circumstances that gave rise to New South Wales border and the emergence of the states on the Eastern seaboard. I might remind everybody that Britain's original claim in the colony in 1786 covered two thirds of the Eastern part of the Australian continent, and it included Norfolk Island and New Zealand. Our borders subsequently changed over time. Van Diemen's Land separated from New South Wales in 1825 and later became known as Tasmania. And in 1825, Britain moved New South Wales border six longitudinal degrees westwards. In 1829, Britain claimed Western Australia, who um, I think would all agree still think they are a separate sovereign nation. But before we move on, I wanted to pay special attention to a little known fact that one of our parliamentary members, the Reverend uh, John Dunmore Lang, was a supporter of the Moreton Bay separation movement in the 1800s, which led to the founding of Queensland and the Port Phillip separation movement, which led to the founding of Victoria. Lastly, I will point to legislation that was passed in New South Wales to permit the separation of Victoria to take effect on the 1st of July, 1851. As we were a colony, this was a mere formality and that the key legislation, the Australian Constitutions Act 1850 was originally passed in the British Parliament. So very soon we will hear from our special guest tonight, Dr. Andre Brett, who only this month was honored with the 2021 Max Crawford Medal of the Australian Academy of the Humanities. So congratulations to you, Andre. I'll now hand back to Rita for a full introduction. Thank you once more. 
Thank you for your warm welcome, Mr. President, and it's wonderful having you here tonight to participate in our program. I will remind the audience that microphones are muted and video cameras are off. If you have questions, please use the chat box and we'll, we will collate and present a selection at the end of the talk. And now it's time for me to introduce our special guest speaker, Dr. Anne Andre Brett. He is currently researching colonial separation movements in Australasia and is an honorary fellow in history at the University of Wollongong. He has recently returned from Canberra, where he was a 2021 National Library of Australia Fellow. And as Mr. President mentioned, he was only this month awarded the 2021 Max Crawford Medal. So without hesitation, I will now hand over to our guest presenter, Dr. Dr. Andre, Andre Brett. Kia ora koto. Thank you for that very, very warm welcome. Uh, and uh, I just wish that I could be saying that uh, at the State Parliament, uh, and instead I am coming to you live, uh, as my hair might suggest, from lockdown in Wollongong. So I will get some slides up for everyone. Oh. There we go. And as I said, I'm coming to you from Wollongong, which are the lands of the Darawal people. Uh, and I'm a Pakeha New Zealander. Uh, my ancestors came across the seas and signed Te Waitangi with the Maori people of Aotearoa. And to those who are seeking similar forms of recognition on this continent, I would simply like to say, Kia kaha, be ever strong. Now, this talk tonight uh, looks at how settlers defined borders in Australasia as part of that process of colonisation and dispossession. As you have just heard, the, the 1st of July this year marked 170 years since the Port Phillip district separated from New South Wales and became the colony, now state of Victoria. Back in 1851, the Argus, a leading Melbourne newspaper, boasted that the depressing influence of our connection with Sydney is at an end. But this was not the day of rejoicing you might expect it was. No, the grand day was Monday, the 11th of November, 1850. That evening, Melbourne learned that the British Parliament had passed the Australian Constitutions Act which, among other things, separated Victoria from New South Wales. Edmund Finn, better known by his literary pseudonym Gary Owen, obtained the intelligence first as part of his job for the Melbourne Morning Herald. Containing his excitement, he kept the news to himself while he rushed an announcement into print. With sufficient copies run off, he and his colleagues wasted no time at delivering it throughout Melbourne. And here it is. Proclaimed glorious news, separation at last, went on with joyful relief. The long oppressed, long buffeted Port Phillip is at length an independent colony, gifted the royal name Victoria. And so began a week of celebrations. The Argus enthused that the occasion is one of universal joy. First was a 21-gun royal salute from Flagstaff Hill at noon Tuesday. On Wednesday night, the whole city shone in a grand illumination. Scarcely a lamp in any house was unlit, and illuminated transparencies filled shop windows. These expressed loyalty to the Queen, and slogans proclaimed that Victoria is free and our bonds are broken. Some cartoons, as you might expect, mocked Sydney. Gary Owen reflected three decades later that never before or since has there been a night of such revel in Melbourne, with half the population intoxicated from drinking and the other half quite as drunk from excitement. The next day was set aside for religious thanksgiving, worshippers no doubt nursing hangovers. By a happy coincidence, Prince's Bridge over the Yarra River had just been constructed, 
in its opening ceremony on Friday, 15th of November, 1850, became the biggest separation celebration of them all. 15,000 people, over a quarter of the population of Victoria, congregated to witness a grand procession cross the Yarra. The people of Melbourne, still not tired of celebrations, held a sports carnival the next day and a fancy dress ball later in the month with Geelong, Portland and outlying districts holding their own events. It was, it seemed, an occasion to remember, an epochal moment in Victoria's history. Yet here we are in 2021, and Victoria observes no holiday to commemorate its founding. Even its historical journal made little mention of the centenary or sesquicentenary. The movements that sought to divide New South Wales into multiple colonies have slipped into obscurity rather than taking a prominent position in our popular historical knowledge. The emergence of Australia's state borders is so poorly understood that no less esteemed a political figure than former Prime Minister Bob Hawke once claimed they represent the meanderings of British explorers across the Australian continent more than 200 years ago. This they do not. Tonight, I will introduce you to some of the most significant and consequential political movements in Australian history, and maybe a couple of the more amusing ones too. The Sydney Morning Herald in August 1860 sighed that the history of this colony is one of dismemberment. To explain what happened in the 1840s and 50s, I'll give you a quick historical overview of what lands Britain claimed and why. I'll then turn to Victoria's successful separation and its, and its influence on other attempts to create new colonies. This talk brings together two overlapping themes. One is the evolution of New South Wales's borders, and the other is the separation movements and their role in defining our polities and regional identities today. Some colonies were created without local pressure. They were decisions taken in Britain based on debates there. Meanwhile, only a few separation movements obtained their goal. They drew far fewer lines on the map than their adherents might have liked. But even those that did not create a new colony contributed greatly to local identity. Who was in, who was out, and the names and symbols that represented an area. This is very much a story of how settlers intended to govern themselves. Rarely did Indigenous peoples loom large in separation movements, and when they did, it was usually in the context of whether separation would enable quicker disposition and exploitation of their lands. So, when Britain decided to colonise Australia, the continent was already a patchwork of Indigenous nations with long-established boundaries, more fluid or permeable than the firm borders European settlers would enforce. Britain's first land border here, which is the one that hopefully you can see I'm moving my mouse around on this map, um, ignore the other lines on there, they were for a different purpose. Um, so this border that I'm moving the mouse around um, was drawn without the knowledge of the people whose lands it divided. It was first articulated in October 1786, uh, before the first fleet set sail, as that is when Arthur Phillip received his commission as Governor of New South Wales. This commission set out the bounds of Britain's territorial claim. From north to south, it encompassed everything from the top of Cape York to the southernmost tip of, of Tasmania, then known as Van Diemen's Land. The western border was the 135th meridian of east longitude, which cuts through the Eyre Peninsula. But there was no defined eastern border. Phillips Commission simply laid claim to, quote, all the islands adjacent in the Pacific Ocean. Philip proclaimed this commission at Sydney Cove on the 7th of February 1788 and formally asserted Britain's possession of the eastern two thirds of the Australian continent, Tasmania, Norfolk Island, New Zealand down to about present day Christchurch and whatever other islands it suited that vague claim to cover. This was a trim, an extraordinarily bold claim on the basis of one small outpost, even by imperial standards of the time. Given the infamous disregard for indigenous ownership, a better word than bold might be shameless or unjust. 
but the colonies, the colonies bounds were not arbitrary. The border along the 135th meridian has its origins in, would you believe, the Treaty of Tordesillas between Portugal and Spain, signed almost three centuries earlier in 1494. It defined Portuguese and Spanish hemispheres of influence in the Atlantic down to a meridian west of the Canary Islands. Why, a meridian that was, unfortunately, defined imprecisely. This treaty's influence on Australia's borders could be a talk unto itself, to be honest. Uh, but the short version is that Britain located the western border along Spain's favoured anti-meridian. That is, if you keep drawing the Tordesillas line through the poles and around the globe. Britain was at war with Spain and had few qualms about claiming the entirety of, of Australia within the Spanish sphere of influence, but it had no desire to antagonize Portugal, its oldest ally, or the Netherlands, its newest, by drawing the border close enough to their claims in Timor or the East Indies as to appear threatening. Now, oops. There we go. This slide on the screen uh, has details of how to find one free text online uh, if you'd like to read more about this particular detail of Australia's cartographic history. Now, New South Wales's western border shuffled six longitudinal degrees west in 1920, uh, 1825, uh, following the 129th meridian, which was Portugal's preferred anti-meridian. This was to take in a settlement at the Tiwi Islands that failed rather quickly as a result of stern indigenous resistance. The border, however, stuck, and New South Wales control never extended further. It is today's Western Australia is today Western Australia's border with South Australia and the Northern Territory. Britain claimed that third of the continent in 1829, and there has never been a significant modification of WA's borders. It is the only state of Australia, never part of New South Wales. Hope you're uh, enjoying my uh, slide transitions. I like to uh, make them a little bit more ridiculous as we go along. So hopefully they're coming through to you on the, str on the stream. Um, now to the east of the Australian continent, that undefined eastern boundary uh, had a simple purpose. It meant trade between Sydney and nearby islands counted as domestic, while otherwise respecting the East India Company's monopoly on British trade between the Cape of Good Hope and Cape Horn. But the company lost its monopoly in 1813, and Britain spent a lot of time humming and harring about whether it really did claim New Zealand. So I'll spare you all the detail, but in 1839, it finally annexed the archipelago to New South Wales. This was for administrative ease while establishing a separate colonial government and negotiating to Te Rutio Waitangi with Māori leaders. Britain then separated New Zealand from New South Wales in November 1840, although that wasn't proclaimed locally until May 1841. So by that point, New South Wales's territory in Australia had already been reduced. Both Van Diemen's Land and South Australia had become freestanding colonies. Van Diemen's Land was removed from New South Wales in part because of local desire. South Australia's removal, like ENZ's, was the result of decisions in London as part of initial colonisation. Now, much of the initiative for Van Diemen's Land separation did come from imperial officials, particularly those in the colonial office, the department that administered most British possessions besides India. But in the early 1820s, Hobart harbored agitation for separation. Over a hundred leading Van Demonians memorialized King George IV in 1824 seeking it. So with local opinion and official thought trending in the same direction, Van Diemen's land became a separate colony in 1825. No other separation movement would enjoy such a smooth path. Sydney papers of the day barely quibbled. The Sydney government was probably relieved to no longer be responsible for such distant settlements. So now we get to South Australia, uh, which was separated from New South Wales in 1836 before colonisation began. There was no settler presence in the region, let alone one to petition for separation. 
The preamble of the Act of the British Parliament that enabled this separation dismissed not only the valid claims to ownership by Aboriginal peoples, but also any nominal claim by Sydney. It comprised only what were called waste and, and, waste and unoccupied lands. Now here's a curious bit. Only the uh, northern border uh, was ever seriously contested. And that contest was between the promoters of the South Australian Association, who wanted everything they could get, and British MPs and the Colonial Office, uh, who wished to constrain its bounds tightly. In the end, a compromise settled on the 26th parallel of South Latitude, today still South Australia's northern border. I do not know, yet, of any clear evidence explaining the choice of 141 degrees east uh, for the eastern border. Gerard Carney suggests this border gave the colony fertile coastal lands and the mouth of the River Murray while retaining a solid buffer with convict settlements east. But most curious is the original border, which I'm highlighting here with my mouse, along, along the 132nd meridian, bring, uh, which left some 800,000 square kilometres of uh, New South Wales sitting between South Australia and WA. Now, as far as I can tell, the South Australian Association saw that land as valueless, so just didn't bother claiming it. Now, I'll mention this strange sliver of New South Wales again later. Now we get to the headline action, Victoria, or I should say the Port Phillip District. Virtually from the moment Europeans founded Melbourne in 1835, they demanded separation. Sales of Port Phillip land in Sydney provoked objections. Using public revenue accrued from Port Phillip to support assisted migrants to Sydney aroused discontent, especially when Melbourne wanted for basic works like decently formed roads. An organisation called the Separation Association formed in 1840, and the local commissioner of Crown Lands, Henry Fish Gisborne, presented George Gipps with a petition requesting separation. So where did this district encompass? Its first borders, drawn in 1839, formed a rectangle from the South Australian border. The district extended to the 146th meridian of East Longitude, which excluded much of northeastern Victoria and Gippsland. The northern boundary was the 136th parallel of South Latitude, which awkwardly cuts through the Murray north of Echuca. Unsurprisingly, Lord John Russell, Colonial Secretary in London and later Prime Minister of the UK, drew a new border in May 1840, one with geographic logic. You might think this followed the Murray. It did not. Russell's border followed the Murrumbidgee River. Um, including within Port Phillip, the region that we now know as the Riverina, and cutting through the future site of Canberra. It possibly goes without saying that this didn't please Sydney. Pastoralists saw it as an attack on their interests, and others feared that the New South Wales Treasury would not benefit from the sale of valuable land. So, after a petition from New South Wales's Legislative Council, the Colonial Office withdrew the boundaries of the Port Phillip District to the Murray River in 1842. The Riverina might be economically and culturally aligned with Melbourne, but there the border has stayed. And if you'll excuse me for a second, I am turning on the lights because I am struggling to see here. Hopefully that is a better view for everyone else as well. So, Back to the Murrumbidgee. Lord John Russell did not propose that on a whim. It was part of a larger plan for the division of New South Wales into three colonies, one south of the Murrumbidgee, one north of the Manning River, which flows through Taree, uh, and a rump middle colony governed from Sydney. This was the first serious plan for creating what is now Victoria and Queensland. Unsurprisingly, Politicians and businessmen in Sydney kicked against reducing the colony's size so drastically. Especially strong objections came from pastoralists, who had pushed their flocks into the territory of the proposed new colonies and squatted on unsold lands of the Crown. They viewed with alarm the, the, the policies that Russell proposed for land sales in the new colonies. The Legislative Council urged him to reconsider. 
As well as advocating for the Murray as the southern border, it proposed the northern border follow the 28th parallel of latitude. This would cut through the central Gold Coast. Uh, and if you know that city well, that would have meant that Narang Railway Station would be just on the border and, uh, and Metricon Stadium would be just within New South Wales. So obviously, legislative council didn't get what it wanted there. Uh, but for the time being, formation of a uh, northern colony lapsed. That wasn't the end of Britain's deliberations over creating new colonies in Australia. The next scheme actually created one, but it wasn't Victoria, nor did it last. It was called North Australia, encompassing all of New South Wales north of the 26th parallel, or in other words, the entirety of the Northern Territory and Queensland down to about Fraser Island. William Gladstone, the future Prime Minister, designed North Australia while Colonial Secretary in the government of Robert Peel, intending it to be a colony for so-called exiles from Britain, convicts who would be pardoned upon landing. A royal charter in February 1846 created North Australia, an advance party headed off to Port Curtis, near the present day city of Gladstone, to found a settlement. Peel's government, however, fell, and our acquaintance from earlier, Lord John Russell, formed a ministry in which the third Earl Grey was colonial secretary. Grey reviled the North Australia scheme and had its charter revoked. Though news of that didn't actually reach the advance party until April 1847, by which time George Barney had been sworn in as a very short-lived lieutenant governor. William Gladstone remained bitter about this, uh, writing half a century later that Earl Grey's decisions had left, quote, a mess. Uh, and because people always ask, uh, the tea is named after Earl Grey's dad, the second Earl. So, British initiative uh, might have carved multiple colonies from New South Wales, uh, but local pressure rooted in local grievances now became the prime motivator. While Britain had been fussing with North Australia, Port Philippians were increasingly unhappy about perceived neglect. They had a superintendent, Charles Latrobe, but real power lay with his superior, Governor Gipps in Sydney. Gipps acknowledged separation was necessary, but made unacceptable suggestions that its legislative bodies be nominated, not elected. And he slashed the public works investment during the first half of the 1840s, despite Port Phillip's revenue exceeding expenditure from 1840 onwards. It was easy for locals to interpret any investment in Sydney as coming at their expense. Port Phillip is a great example of the political consequences of settlers occupying new hinterlands. When settlement was concentrated close to the seat of government, there was one discrete community. But as it expanded, it splintered into multiple communities who saw each other as rivals. From 1843, Port Phillip gained some say in government when the Legislative Council, back then the only House of Parliament, became two thirds elected. Problem was, Port Phillip's six members were in a decided majority among the total of 36. And worse, these representatives had to basically be Sydney residents. Local middle classes chafed under an inability to influence or partake in public life. Steamships had not yet become a mainstay of Australian waters, never mind rail or air travel. So locals who successfully sought election had to leave their families and their livelihoods for months on end. Obviously, this meant only men of substantial means could consider running for office. All Port Philippians had to seek sympathetic Sydney siders. And one of the latter was a fellow called John Dunmore Lamb, whose name looms larger than any other in the history of separation. A Presbyterian minister, bitter opponent of Catholicism, and a radical Republican and Democrat. He had seemingly limitless energy for public controversy and self-promotion. He saw the US as a positive vision for Australia, a federal union of geographically compact colonies. To achieve an independent republic, which he dubbed the United Provinces of Australia, Lang promoted separation movements enthusiastically in one election as one of Port Phillip's first legislative councillors. 
Never shy of stern words, he condemned the location of the border along the Murray as an outcome of selfishness or caprice. Uh, now, Superintendent Latrobe and the Port Phillip Separation Committee both pressed uh, the colonial office in 1846 to reconsider the matter of the border. And they were confident this would result in a decision in their favour. But an independent arbiter was never appointed to consider it. The colonial office and imperial parliament faced many urgent issues. And by comparison with unrest in French Canada, or writing a constitution for New Zealand, or conflict in Southern Africa, the requests of Melbourne seemed of little import. Earl Grey, moreover, wished to include separation in a larger scheme to reform the constitutions of these of all Australian colonies, and it slowed any action. So although he indicated imperial preference for separation early after taking office in 1846, he was in no hurry to actually do anything about it. Port Philippians resorted to desperate measures to force his hand. At the 1848 Legislative Council elections, the electoral district of the city of Melbourne got to choose one member, and the electoral district of Port Phillip had five. This election was held before the innovation that all seats go to the polls on the same day. Melbourne voted before the district. The Port Phillip Gazette described commotion in Melbourne. The thinking portion of the community having arrived at the conclusion that representation in the Legislative Council at Sydney under existing circumstances was a farce, Earl Grey was consequently proposed. He was manifestly ineligible for election, but despite the fact he'd never set foot on the Australian continent, he won three quarters of the vote and was declared elected amidst enthusiastic cheering. Superintendent Latrobe attributed this to, quote, sudden impulse when reporting the outcome to his superior, new governor Charles Fitzroy, but it was really the outcome of years of frustration. The next day, separatists pressed the public to nominate nobody for the electoral district of Port Phillip, an election couldn't be held. A month later, Latrobe, on Fitzroy's instructions, ordered a new poll, this time in Geelong rather than Melbourne, and the people of Geelong proved more willing to cast ballots. Separatists advanced another mock slate. The Duke of Clinton, Lord Palmerston, Lord Brougham, Lord John Russell, and Sir Robert Peel. This time, however, it received less than a fifth of the vote. So five of the six seats from the Port Phillip district had actual representatives, while Earl Grey's seat was not declared vacant on account of absence until 1850. And funnily enough, the by-election for his replacement was a mere four days before news of separation reached Melbourne. Separation was overdue when it finally came. Politicians and public servants in London had generally favoured it since 1840. They were, in fact, sometimes better disposed than their local officials. Fitzroy went so far as saying after the 1848 elections that, quote, a community where such an act of folly is allowed to be gravely and deliberately committed is scarcely fit to be trusted with the exercise of the rights of a free representative system. Such condescension, today unacceptable, reflected conservative political thought of the time towards democracy. But in the end, Port Phillip's pressure was enough to coax British officials into action, even if they didn't perceive it to be the priority that Melburnians did. Now, the fact that the uh, true celebration of separation was in November 1850, not July 1851, puts paid to conspiracy theories uh, that because the discovery of payable gold was announced mere weeks after separation, it had been obscured to guarantee New South Wales would not impede separation. Consider also that many early settlers viewed gold rushes with disdain. Gold seekers swabbed pastoral lands and expanded the electorate with voters whose views contrasted with established gentry. But here lies a crucial point. 
Although our intense interstate rivalries emerged in the 1840s, Victoria doesn't celebrate separation today because the population who rushed to the gold fields took separation for granted. We continue to do so. Separation appears natural, despite the fact it required a sustained campaign uniting social classes and interests. And those who came to Victoria in the years immediately afterwards took the discovery of gold as more significant, for that's what brought them there. Nonetheless, the influence of Victoria's separation echoed into subsequent decades. For one thing, it gave impetus to advocates of other separations, such as uh, John Dunmore Lang, uh, who, even before Victoria succeeded, promoted a colony called Cooksland for Northern Australia. He deplored much of the violence that pastoralists inflicted on Aboriginal peoples and saw reliance on convict labour as a moral failing. In tune with paternal humanitarianism of the era, he believed that only the settlement of, a, of what he called an industrious and virtuous agricultural population would stem the frontier bloodshed and, in his belief, elevate the character of European occupation. That's the irony then, is agitation uh, began among squatters. On the 23rd of July, 1850, pastoralists approved separatist resolutions at a meeting near Toowoomba. Their grievances related to public revenue, banking and export markets. And it was their good fortune that Brisbane merchants and professionals also wanted separation as they found the Sydney government remote and unresponsive. The campaign that created Queensland got an early boost. The Australian Constitutions Act that created Victoria had a clause permitting the separation of everywhere above the, um, above the 30th parallel, which, as you can see on the map here, passes between Grafton uh, and Coffs Harbour. Now, Lane claimed credit for this, but the historian GP Shaw has located files showing that it was conceived by Earl Grey and pastoralists to circumvent an agreement that no more convicts be sent to New South Wales. Convict transportation was controversial, and momentum for northern separation faltered when the movement split over the issue. When the Earl of Derby's Conservative government succeeded Lord John Russell's Whig government in 1852, the new colonial secretary, Sir John Pakington, made it clear that Britain no longer supported transportation to anywhere on Australia's east coast, and a separation petition advocating it wouldn't succeed. So transportation's promoters realised the game was up. In August 1854, one of them colourfully suggested that anyone who so much as mentioned the topic was an ass. Now, running low on time, so I will spare you uh, all the details of how Queensland obtained separation. Uh, it got there in 1859. Most relevant for this talk is how the border came to be in its current spot. Separatists wanted it along the 30th parallel, um, while implacably hostile Sydney MPs wanted it up here on the 26th parallel, um, as used for North Australia, the short-lived colony I mentioned before. The Colonial Office spent much time deliberating on this and took a compromise from New South Wales Governor William Dennison, and that is the border that we have today. It left New England in the Northern Rivers in New South Wales, and they have agitated for separation regularly. Uh, Lang reused the Cooksland name in proposing a new colony centred on Grafton and the Clarence River in the 1860s, and a century later, a referendum for New England statehood failed narrowly. It wasn't the only region inspired by the successes of Victoria and Queensland. It can be easy to mistake our borders today as natural or inevitable, but Australians, uh, settlers, but if some settlers had had their way, the map might be drawn very differently. Lang, yes, yet again, uh, coined the name Riverina when he wrote to Albury's border post in January 1857 to endorse separation. A movement coalesced quickly uh, with Daniloquin in its heartland and pastoralists as firmest advocates. And so Lang actually fell out with them bitterly. Uh, Leighton Frappel has written uh, an excellent book, which coincidentally I have right here, called uh, Lords of the Saltbush Plains, which details the Riverina movement. 
He shows that individuals such as the unrelated Gideon Lang tried desperately to hold together class-based factions and soothe rivalries between Daniloquin pastoralists and the townspeople of Albury and Wagga Wagga, but they couldn't. The campaign created a regional Riverina identity, but not a colony. So in the end, most adjustments made to New South Wales borders after Queensland separation were to resolve the problem that from 1859 to 1863, New South Wales had two separate halves, the present day state and a second half uh, that's now pretty much the Northern Territory. Britain's attempt to settle Central Australia had so far failed, with Indigenous peoples there feeling the sting of colonisation primarily through disease. So you might recall that earlier I mentioned a strange sliver of New South Wales between South Australia and WA. South Australia's founders came to regret not drawing their border right up to Western Australia, and in the end, Britain saw the logic of removing that territory from New South Wales. Um, Next, Queensland's western border north of South Australia shuffled three latitudinal degrees in 1862. Pastoralists coveted the plains of promise that they perceived around the Gulf of Carpentaria, and the border divided that in two. Land on the New South Wales side was impossible to administer from Sydney, but nobody could have seen, foreseen the biggest consequence of moving the border west. It placed the mineral deposits of Mount Isa in Queensland. So a year later in 1863, Britain acceded to South Australia's desire to control the Northern Territory, transferring it to that colony and thereby settling New South Wales borders roughly as we know them, with major changes since being the removal of the Australian Capital Territory and Jervis Bay in the 1910s. That same decade, South Australia handed the Northern Territory to the federal government, having found transcontinental colonisation difficult and expensive. Suffice it to say that the history of the Northern Territory would be rather different if it had contained Mount Isa when John Campbell Miles identified its mineral wealth in 1923. Oh, now I hope you enjoy that transition. That's a spectacular one. So... The decisions taken during the 19th century about how to divide the Australian continent have therefore had enduring ramifications. They defined the borders that shape our lives and which have been brought into stark relief since March 2020. These divisions were not arbitrary, but resulted from many influences and competing interests, and separation movements cultivated our regional identities. I'll conclude with a vignette about how the influence of Victoria's colonial divorce was so great it extended across the ditch. When the Otago Gold Rush began in New Zealand in 1861, people flooded to Dunedin from the Victorian fields. They had witnessed Victoria's stride since separation and knew of Queensland's success. One erstwhile Victorian, Julius Vogel, founded New Zealand's first daily newspaper, the Otago Daily Times. And by early 1862, he was convinced the North Island was accruing unearned wealth from the South Island's gold. He spearheaded a Southern Separation League and the topic dominated Otago politics for a decade. A fellow newspaper editor in Auckland looked askance at his Southern compatriots. He wrote that an element apparently of Australian origin, is influencing men's minds in that whilom canny Caledonian city. Locals seem to be labouring under the happy delusion that they may shear off at any moment. In the end, South Island separation proved to be little more than a daydream, but it contributed to the firm identity you can't avoid noticing if you visit that wonderful part of the world. Now, little did the revelers of Mel in Melbourne in November 1850 know how wide their influence would be, or how we would look on gold rushes, not separation, as a pivotal event setting Victoria on a different course to New South Wales. Borders are what we make them, and political boundaries possess, often possess more complex historical origins than people expect. It is easy to imagine that slightly different decisions would have made Federation more difficult or undermined it altogether. History is contingent, 
separatists in Riverina, Otago, or New England 160 years ago were as oblivious to the eventual failure to their eventual failures as we are right now to when we might be able to travel interstate again without worrying about borders slamming shut. Take care out there. Thank you. Hello, we're back again. Well, thank you, Brett uh, and Andre. That was fantastic. Uh, I'm sure there are going to be some questions, and um, I think I will open up with uh, with something for you because, of course, this uh, concerns the Parliament itself uh, quite a bit because of the Reverend John Dunmore Lang. Um, I would be wondering how did John Dunmore Lang persuade people of Port Phillip that he was the right man to represent their interests in Sydney? Indeed, and the thing there is, it was actually a request made to him. Uh, he had already distinguished himself in, at the start of the 1840s as a strong opponent, uh, not just of uh, you know, overbearing colonial office control of um, of, of Australia, uh, of New South Wales, sorry, uh, but also that he had set himself up as a great critic of the existing legislative council and the governor. So when a group of uh, Scottish settlers in Port Phillip were looking for someone to represent them in Sydney, it was only natural that they would turn to a fellow Scottish Presbyterian who had already made a name for himself, basically promoting similar things to them and who they felt would definitely be sympathetic to their grievances, as he very much was. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, and I think that New South Wales being in such a, an enormous state would have been quite unwielding. Um, Absolutely, especially, you know, before rail transport or the telegraph or anything came around, it was very difficult to govern these long distances. You see all these decisions like Norton, the North Australia colony uh, having its letters patent revoked, but the news taking so long to get down here that a lieutenant governor still managed to get sworn in. It took half a year for decisions to get places. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, we have a question from uh, the audience and uh, uh, the Darren is thanking you uh, and uh, for the talk. And he's wondering whether there is a separation movement that you find most interesting. Ah, oh, thank you. No, I love that question. That is a great one. Um, there is actually, let me see if I can go back a couple of slides here. Whoops, there we go. My favourite one is one that I actually didn't have the time to mention, so I'm delighted to be asked about it. This one that I'm highlighting around here, Princeland. Uh, Princeland is a separation movement uh, that emerged in Portland in Western Victoria in the early 1860s that tried to create a cross-border colony uniting Western Victoria and Southeastern South Australia into one colony. It was short-lived in part because they struggled to get support from the South Australians. People in Mount Gambia were initially sympathetic, but the Adelaide government was very quickly responsive and invested in a whole bunch of stuff down there. Uh, so the movement became focused on Western Victoria uh, and founded when uh, there was just a bit too much rivalry between Portland, Hamilton, uh, Warn and Warrnambool about, oh, and um, Port Ferry as well, about who would get to be capital, who would get to be the main port. It's it's a wonderfully obscure, fascinating movement um, that, you know, it, with the way borders have been in the last couple of years, uh, I imagine <laughs> some people who live in those border communities might wish that they uh, had a state of their own. <laughs> okay, I hope that satisfies uh, Darren. And now we've got one from Anthony. Um, sorry, I've just lost it. Do you feel that New South Wales, oh, no, we did actually ask that one. I think Anthony has another question about the Riverina. Oh, yes. Oh, 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 oh. oh, sorry, this is difficult to manage the size of these little window panels that I've got here. Um, how far did Riverina separatist movements get? 
You mentioned New England actually had a referendum, but did the Riverina one even get serious traction and movements within the park and movements within the parliament or other bodies? Right. So the thing about the Riverina movement is that because the pastoralists uh, whose hub was Deniliquin dominated it so thoroughly, they failed to find the necessary cross-class, cross-part, multi-partisan uh, sort of momentum that a movement requires uh, to be successful. So that one rumbled along from about 1857 when John Dunmore Lang says, yes, this is a good idea, through to 1865. They send a petition to the Queen. Uh, they try very hard. But in the end, um, John Dunmore Lang uh, broke with them absolutely because he became disgusted by the pastoralists doing this out of what he saw as just rank self-interest to control land and uh, their own hypothetical parliament. Um, and another fellow called Gideon Lang, who I mentioned is totally unrelated to um, Dunmore Lang, um, he had tried and tried to keep these people together. But in the end, when you had uh, some riverine separatists drawing their border so that it didn't even include Albury or Wagga Wagga, he was just, I'm out of here. Uh, so that flopped in the mid 1860s and that was pretty much the end of that. Now, my research has been focused on the colonial period and you don't see much more rumbling about Riverina separation in the colonial period. The occasional bit when, you know, they want a railway built and they're not getting it. So they start talking about, oh, maybe we'll seek annexation to Victoria. Maybe we'll become a colony. Um, I am aware that there was some rumbling um, between World War I and World War II about a Riverina state, uh, but I must confess I don't know much about that one. But it certainly didn't get as far as a referendum like New England did in 1967, which I should note failed only narrowly. Mm. It's interesting how things were a little bit more fluid back then. Mm. Uh, and now we have one from Carolyn Holbrook in the audience. Uh, thanking you very much for a terrific presentation. Uh, Carolyn is wondering if there is much evidence of Victorians' excitement about separation in 1850 and whether that enthusiasm clearly overshadowed enthusiasm in 1901 for federation when people seem to have been most excited about the visiting royal celebrities. Ha. Um, I'm not surprised <laughs> Carolyn would be asking that question. Thank you. And by the way, <laughs> she, lo she loved your uh, transitions, <laughs> which ah, I did I'm too. Gl I'm glad those were enjoyable. Uh, no, thank you for that. Um, certainly, well, Carolyn would know the 1901 celebrations better than I do. Um, but the celebrations in 1850, um, when the news of separation arrived were, to use a technical and professional term, off the chain. Uh, this was the biggest moment in Melbourne's history to date. And those who were alive for it, uh, who were there for it, seemed to think that it always would be. Um, you know, the, the grand illumination uh, of the Wednesday night following the receipt of the news, uh, you know, from all sources just sounds absolutely spectacular that everybody was out of doors celebrating this moment. Um, perhaps to my slight surprise, um, the actual formal separation on the 1st of July 1851 doesn't occasion a huge amount of comment in the newspapers, but I think it's because that was just purely a formality where, you know, writs for elections were issued and all of that, that they'd already, you know, partied their hearts out in November 1850. Um, but then, you know, the, the rush for gold changes the character of the polity just almost overnight. And these celebrations, although of epochal importance in 1850, are very quickly swept aside by gold fever and that even people, you know, there within five or 10 years are seeing gold, not separation, as the defining characteristic. Now I'm going to take you to the uh, Spanish and uh, 
Portugal scenario again. Um, uh, Jennifer Gallagher is asking, could you explain just in simple terms how the agreement between Spain and Portugal to divide up the world impacted on Australia? Now, <laughs> we don't have a lot of time. <laughs> But okay, so you can put it into uh, a succinct fashion. Yes. Okay. So basically, um, Spain and Portugal were dividing spheres of influence um, that followed a meridian down the Atlantic. This is what gave Portugal in you know European imperial power in Africa and Spain in South America, um, and. The line ended up, you know, cutting through South America in such a way that um, Brazil became part of the Portuguese sphere of influence. Um, and so once they realized, you know, colonization is coming around the globe, it was where do these spheres then meet? So you've got the meridian that they drew down the Atlantic. Then there's the meridian, uh, the anti-meridian on the other side of the globe. So the problem was Spain and Portugal didn't actually agree on where that meridian was drawn. And Britain, in drawing the original border of New South Wales, was simply choosing, using it as a line so that they would avoid offending their allies, Portugal and the Netherlands, and they did not care if they offended Spain because they were at war. So I hope that tries to make it clear it is unbelievably convoluted. Mm, I think a little bit far beyond uh, what we're looking at today. But... I'm going to now take you to the 20th century. We have somebody with a question about Newcastle. Ah, oh, yes. Okay, so thinking about the 20th century, there was a movement to create a new state in northern New South Wales with Newcastle as its capital. Did that align with the earlier colonial movement to divide New South Wales north and south? Not so much. Well, the movement was to have Newcastle and probably Armadale is the capital. capital. Um, now, that one, it does have colonial land descendants, but those are more related to the separation of um, the separation of Queensland failing to include um, New England. Um, New England pastoralists were originally involved in the Queensland campaign, um, but as time sort of moved on later in the 1850s some of them actually decided that they had more in common with the sydney government so it wasn't until I'm trying to think of this succinctly there's various rumblings from the 1850s through to 1900 about possible separation of new england and the northern rivers uh sometimes including uh newcastle as support sometimes envisaging grafton as a big port um but those don't get anywhere significant until after World War I, when the country party emerges in New England, you know, with its great power bases in places like Armadale, Glen Innes, and Tenterfield. And it adopts, uh, you know, New England separation as one of its leading causes. Okay, we're jumping around a little bit, but I'm going to ask something more that has a, um, a bit of a, a social history type of um, uh, bent to it. Um, so we have a question from Eric and uh, they're asking whether the extent of the territory disputes and debates between New South Wales and neighbouring colonies shaped present day relations. Yeah, I mean, I certainly think obviously, you know, drawing a border and setting it, you know, firm, you know, firmly on a map uh, create so sort of, you know, community divisions that, that often the hottest, you know, border rivalries can be those right on the border. Um, so much has happened since that, you know, can you attribute direct continuity from these movements? Probably not, because there's been so much, you know, fluctuation of different issues. But the borders that these movements set have shaped often the terms of reference of these movements. Um, they have, you know, defined our social identities, defined our sporting identities quite often. Um, and, you know, they the borders continue to matter, oh. even if, you know, the movements ended and different political movements arose in their place. Um, and that often we, we kind of, you know, have a habit of taking these borders as maybe a bit arbitrary or inconvenient rather than recognising that they responded to 
quite big debates. And there is provision within the constitution to actually move the borders if we decide that they are no longer suited to our present needs. But uh, the constitutional provisions are probably very hard to meet. And uh, we certainly haven't had movements significant enough to even get close to those. Well, I'm very sad to say we've actually now arrived to our conclusion time. Very sad. We could have actually sat here and asked many, many more questions, Andre. Uh, it, it's a shame. That we well, I'm just delighted that people are interested in asking things. And uh, here I will, just as we sign off, I will flick back to my last slide, which has contact details if anyone would like to get in touch. Um, if anyone knows of any more separation movements, I've uncovered uh, 12 from the colonial period so far, but uh, some of them are quite obscure. And if, uh, I'm, I'm always keen to talk to people about separation movements and whatever they might know about them. I think it's a wonderful topic. Mm, and I do understand this is an area of research that you're going into. Yep. Yeah, so yeah, this is kind of my next so big okay. project, so to speak. Wonderful. Okay, great to hear. We want to see a lot more from, from you on that topic. So I want to say a big thank you to you, Andre. That was a brilliant and engaging presentation. And of course, thank you to everyone participating. There were some thoughtful and really interesting questions and we could have expanded even further. And I would like to again thank the Honourable Matthew Mason Cox for taking time to be with us. And it's been a great pleasure to have you here tonight. I might recommend that you join us on our Parliament of New South Wales Facebook, Instagram and LinkedIn accounts to hear about programs we have and to engage in conversations about civics and citizenship. And of course, you can also find information on our website and subscribe to our newsletter for updates. So now it's good, good evening for us. I hope you've made a great contact with our special guest speaker tonight and you continue to have this conversation with him. And I want to say thank you to Dr. Andre Brett. We're glad you could make it and I hope we meet again through future programs. Thank you very much for having me. It's been delightful. Oh, it's been a great pleasure. Thank you.